<coughs> All right, so we're going to continue with Pirkei Avot, where we left off before Chagas Shavuot. We're holding Perek Bet, Mishnah Dalet. I believe that this Mishnah is one of the most important Mishnayot uh, in Pirkei Avot. There are many, many others, of course, that are, they are all important. In this Mishnah, however, we will find various pieces of advice. Quite a few, a few points are made in this Mishnah. It's a longer Mishnah than the typical. And uh, we're just going to spend the next hour just on this one Mishnah. As I said before, Chagas Shavuot, in this Mishnah, at the very beginning of this Mishnah, we actually have the answer or the, the key to how do we get people to do what we would like them to do. No, it's, it's not easy. We left off with the advice that was given that one should not rely on politicians. They promise, but they don't keep what they promise. They don't do things Hashem Shamayim. They don't really mean it, perhaps, or the situation has changed where they have no control. Either way, we are told to rely on Hashem, not to rely on human beings, not to expect uh, that people will follow through, even though they may have meant it, even though at one time they they said they would. All kinds of things happened that uh, circumstances change and uh, what was possible before may no longer be possible. Therefore, turn to Hashem, pray to Hashem, depend only on Him. It does not mean, however, it does not come to exclude any hishtadlut, any efforts that we may sometimes make. One is allowed to make an effort one is allowed to uh, ask people for favors if, if there is a chance, a possibility that, 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 that they may be a source of help. It doesn't mean we should ignore that completely. Uh, sometimes that's what we need to do. However, the greater the bitachon, the faith on one hand in God, the less he has to rely on people. And this, the first words of this Mishnah has to, have to do with an individual who is able to become so close to Hashem and have such a close relationship where basically his wishes are Hashem's wishes. Isn't that beautiful? <laughs> Whatever you say, you want me to do something for you, I take care of it for you. That's wonderful. How do you get to that? Always make an effort that your wishes or your will should be His will. In other words, make sure that whatever Hashem wants of you should be what you want. Whatever Hashem commands us, whatever Hashem metzave in other words, instructs us, should come easy to us. It should come easy to us in the same way that we would want it or wish it for ourselves. So get used to Wanting what Hashem wants, basically, that's what he's saying. So, make his wishes your wishes, so that he should make your wishes his wishes. In other words, Hashem will correspond in the, in the same manner. If we take it seriously, what Hashem tells us to do, and we have no trouble with it, on the contrary, we treat it as though this is something we want for ourselves, then Hashem will make it so that whatever we want, what we really want on our own, He will also grant it to us. He will make it that that, that is His wish as well. On the other hand, similarly, annul, batel means to annul, to cancel, to nullify your wishes before his wishes so that he should nullify the other others wishes other people's wishes for your wishes in other words other people may have other plans and they may uh, of course not be what we want other people may wish certain things that we are not happy about so here's a way to cancel their wishes and to and to allow for your wishes to uh, prevail. 
So how do we do that? Similarly to what we said before, batel retzonach mipnei retzono. One has to be close to Hashem in the following way, that we don't let our wishes get in the way with Hashem's wishes. In other words, we say, our wishes don't matter, don't count right now if, I, if at this moment I have a mitzvah, if at this moment I have Hashem's wishes to fulfill, to consider. So if I put aside my own personal wishes before His wishes, He will put aside the wishes of others, the interests and desires of others before my wishes. It, it sounds quite simple, but it's, it's not so easy. As we will see, people have a very hard time with this for some reason. There's a great deal of yetzerara involved, of course, in life. Yetzerara meaning the evil inclination. And the evil inclination basically says, you come first. Right? The, the human mind is such that it is very, very focused, very much wants certain things for itself. That's just normal, it's natural. Nothing wrong with that. You know, one should take care of himself. Baruch Hashem, people are interested in themselves. Some people, you know, have a lack of interest and they're depressed, right? They don't have the self-esteem. So to have a, a certain amount of interest in oneself, in one's goals and aspirations, is quite healthy. It all depends, of course, to what extent. I mean, a person should not be completely self-centered, where everything revolves around him only and excludes everyone else. No, that, of course, that's not good. Rabbi Stel Saddam Zakhdiot Mi'uravi Mabriyot, one has to be, uh, I guess in English we would say, he has to learn to get along with everyone and to be involved in other people's lives too. And not choose to be a hermit, not to be just focused on, on his own affairs. So there are times in life when there are um, conflicts, I guess is the best word. Conflicts between what we want and what Hashem wants. Conflicts between what we want and what others want. And it's not easy, not easy. Who has to give? Who has to give? Who has to give in? You know, sometimes it's possible to compromise, sometimes it's not. So what do you do? So right now, we're not so much talking about conflicts between individuals, husband and wife, perhaps differences, neighbors, friends, family. Here we're talking about one's own agenda, one's own interests, and Hashem. Hashem has a plan. Hashem has a plan for us. It's not for Him. Uh, Hashem doesn't need anything. It's all for us. It's all for us, obviously. It, whatever he wants for us ultimately affects him too, affects his, in the entire world. So indirectly, it's for him too. But Hashem's plans and designs are crucial. It's not just a, an ideal situation that he would prefer that we do certain things. No. These things, these mitzvot that Hashem requests of us and, and asks us to do are very, very crucial. Very crucial to the integrity of this creation. Am was was given a mission, and this is a very serious mission. It's a, it's a big responsibility. We have to be, we have to consider it. We have to realize that this is not just a tradition. Oh, my parents had a tradition, you know. This is optional. No, mitzvot are, the word mitzvah is a commandment. Even though I said Hashem requested of us, He gave us instructions. The word commandment is a pretty heavy word. He commanded us. He commanded us because at times we may not understand what He wants of us. What is this? It's not logical. It doesn't make any sense. Well, it's not up to you to try to figure it out. We don't have the mind. We just don't have the faculties. We don't have the ability to be able to figure out Hashem's wishes. What is possible for us to do is to be in sync. I think that's a good word for this. Be in sync, that our wishes and interests should be in sync, synchronated with Hashem's wishes and interests. And the way to go about it is to think. When I buy a car 
or I buy a garment, or I buy anything that has great value, and I spend a lot of money on it, I want it to last. You want it to last? Yeah, it's something that you want for yourself. You want the best, you want something good. In the same way, you should want for the mitzvot of Hashem. You should want to perform the mitzvot with the same zeal, with the same eagerness, with the same excitement, with the same goals that this should last, that this should endure, that it should, that it should uh, come out successful, right? Depending on what the mitzvah is. In the same way we want things for ourselves, we should want it for the mitzvot as well. At times we become, we get busy. And when we get busy, it becomes challenging to do certain things that are not on our list of priorities, perhaps. The rabbis are telling us over here, listen, be careful with Hashem's priorities. Don't minimize Hashem's priorities. In the same way you don't minimize yours, don't minimize His. Because in the end, this will have consequences. The way one respects, the way one looks up and treats the mitzvot, that's how it will be years from now. In other words, if he respects them, he elevates them, he gives them tremendous priority in it, and his full and utmost attention. In, in, in many, many ways, that will be his attitude and his relationship with the mitzvot for the rest of his life. The way you begin, the way you, you associate yourself and deal with the mitzvot initially, Hopefully, that is that way it will continue to be. So it's important to not only have a good head start, but to, from time to time to think about it. Are we fair? Are we treating the mitzvot in the same way as we're treating our own personal interests, whether it's a hobby or goal or job or anything? Our own personal, are we treating it the same? Because we want it to be the same, because this is what we want to achieve. A real close relationship where our ratzon is his ratzon, where his ratzon is our ratzon. Right? In other words, whatever his wishes are should be our wishes. So in order for that to happen, obviously, it requires a certain training of the mind. And, and training of the mind involves the proper respect of the mitzvot, the same eagerness to fulfill the mitzvot as we do for our own things, etc. This is especially true when one is in some sort of predicament, in a very difficult situation. When one is in a difficult situation, he's not always himself. People are under stress. People do not act the same. When, when life is hard, when things are, are tough, people are not, you know, they just don't do things in the same way that they used to do it when things were right. When it comes to mitzvot, chaz v'shalom, there's always that danger that a Jew may falter. He may become lax, he may not want to anymore, he may have complaints, he may be upset, whatever. That is the time to be very, very careful, lo levater not to give in. Whatever I used to do during the good days, I'm going to continue to do even now when things are, are tough. Because there are tough times in life. And the best way to understand a tough time or a challenging time is with the weather. You'll see why. Imagine that it's stormy outside. Stormy, windy, rain, maybe even hail. And you, you have a shiur. Ah, maybe I shouldn't go. You, 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 one begins to hesitate. The weather, it's difficult. With or without our umbrella doesn't make a dif difference. You can still get very, very, very wet. Michael will take care of the clothes later for you. you know. <laughs> <laughs> but it's, it's hard. It's cold. It's wet. All right, so you hesitate. But wait a minute. Just think about it. What happens if in the same weather, a very important customer is waiting for you <laughs> at the business? Would you think twice about it? No, <laughs> I don't think so. You see what I mean? 
Th these are the kinds of tests that everyone can do, can do to himself. And that's where you can begin to compare. Wait a minute. It's not the same, but it should be the same. Mm -hmm. In Batel Retzonra, Mitne Retzono, the commentaries explain what that means to nullify, to give up our Retzon. It also includes sometimes an expenditure, a loss of money. It may be that we have to spend some money because of some mitzvah. It was as a result of this effort that we're making. Yeah, it may require to spend some money, whatever it is. It may involve Bikur Cholim visiting the sick. It may involve a chesed. It may involve a, a, an unusual amount that we need to give for tzedakah for some important cause that just came up. Uh, Canceling uh, an appointment that may, that may be a 10% penalty because of a mitzvah that we need to do. In other words, there are times that because of the mitzvah, we may uh, experience some financial loss. Okay, that's part of it. In other words, that should not always be, I say not always, because sometimes, obviously, you're allowed to evaluate the situation. I mean, you're not gonna lose <coughs> thousands of dollars depending on what the situation is, but it, sometimes it may be the case that one has to be prepared to experience a little bit of a loss if, if that's what we're gonna get him to do the mitzvah to do, for him to do the right thing. So why doesn't everybody get this right? Very simple, because not everyone knows what they really want. What do people want? You know, it's confusing. Everybody wants to do the right thing, I hope. Everybody wants to do the good thing. But not everybody knows what's right for them. Not everyone has clarity of what is really good, of what is proper, what is right and correct. So there's a lot of, a, lot, a lack of clarity when it comes to what should we want? Well, I tell husband and wife that they should want to succeed. <laughs> they should want to be together. They should want to build a home together, regardless of the differences, regardless of, of all the challenges that await them. That's what they should want, and they should aim for that. How do you make it work? That's a different question. But people have to want it. If somebody doesn't want that, there's some, there's some big problem here. And that's what's happening sometimes. I have seen situations where the person has told me, but I don't want it. <laughs> I'm not interested. You're right, he says, or she says, but I don't want it. There's nothing you can do anymore then. Because if you, you first have to want. If you don't want, <laughs> you want, but you don't know how, okay, we can get you some help. But you have to want. The person has to want to get married. If he doesn't want to get married, <laughs> you can bring him a nice girl, or you can bring her a nice boy, and, all kinds of things can come up as to why they don't want to continue the date. You, you have to want to first, to have clarity about that, that this is important, that this is the right thing to do, this is what Hashem wants. And then we can take the next step of well, what do I need to make it work? What do I need to do to make it work? So since we don't always know what is right and what we should want, the emphasis over here is, well, but tell Ratzoncha, if they did so, no. Then forget about what you want because you don't always know what you want and concentrate on what he wants. So if you don't know what you want, look up what he wants and want what he wants for you. So this is one way of, of avoiding mistakes of many pitfalls is focusing on what does, what does Hashem want me to do. In this way, I know I'm safe. Another interpretation, I have an important interpretation of the words batel retzonach mitne retzono is work alamidot, as it's called in Hebrew, ha'avara alamidot. Avara alamidot means to overcome our weaknesses, overcome our characteristics that are, that are weak, that are unpolished, not refined. That's called la'avira alamidot. It was not to insist on having it your way, not to insist on being who you are. Accept me the way I am. Some people say, no, 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 no. That's not an excuse. That's not a, a way to, 
to uh, to live with uh, with with your spouse or with anyone accept me the way I am. No, of course people are what they are, and we have to to an extent accept them. But the individual himself should not be content with that. He should learn la avir. La avir la midot means to overcome, to overpower himself, to 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 find strength, to to control his midot. Not just to be what his midah is. He's an angry person, he's going to remain an angry person. That's the way I am. No. Of course that's the way you are, but you need to be ma'avir. You need to try to overcome that. And life is about challenges. And this is, a, this is an additional challenge for you. You may not have the challenge of making too much money. In other words, it comes easy to you. But you'll have a challenge in some other area. Right? People have different kinds of challenges. So la avira la mitot is an important area in life that we need to work on because everyone has some weakness that during difficult times it comes up. Whether it's stinginess, anger, uh, laziness, all kinds of mitot, all kinds of characteristic traits. So batel, one has to train himself to be mevatel his ratzon. His ratzon means his own way of being. And try to deal with it properly by overcoming uh, the negative in, in those midot. And if one does so, midah ke nege midah, Kadosh Baruch Hu will also be ma'avira la midot. He will also overcome the attribute of justice and won't be strict with us and will also be giving in, giving in in the sense of being easygoing with us, not very, very demanding or exacting. I saw a view, beautiful commentary. Actually, this one, I think, is the Rambam, but there are others who say something similar. That the, for the most part, the greatest difficulty man, the human being, has is with the Chomriyut HaGuf. Chomriyut HaGuf means that the physical body is physical. Physical, it's, it's Homer. And because it's, it's, it's physical, it interferes with the nefesh which is spiritual, the soul. And that interference is what clouds, clouds the, or obfuscates, I think is the word in English. I don't know if, it, I know in Spanish they say that, but in English, I guess, you know what I mean by, it, it blurs, maybe blurs is the better way in English. The homer, the physical body blurs the neshama's ability to see with clarity. The neshama is pure. It's so clean. It's an angel, right? But it's within the body, the physical body, which may be a very rough physical body, depending on the individual. And that physical body and the physical body's needs get in the way. Don't let the nefesh or the neshama to express itself. So what is the trick? The trick is to eliminate those meni'im, to eliminate those things that prevent the nefesh from being what it, what it could be, which involves controlling oneself, involves working on oneself, one's mitot, uh, eating less perhaps, right? De-emphasizing that which is physical. The best way to understand this is with the following mashal, parable. Imagine somebody had a, a bird in a cage and he decided, you know what? I want to release this bird. I feel for it. A bird in a cage, I mean, it's nice to look at, but the bird is suffering in a sense. She doesn't have the freedom to fly. So this man felt for her. and He said, I'm going to release her. So he, he starts putting in his hand into the cage, and somebody tells him, you don't need to do that. Why try so hard to stick your hand in that cage? You know, the cage is not easy to stick your hand in. But why do that to take out the bird? Just open the door. <laughs> open that little door and the bird will fly out. That's the way it is with the neshama. Open the door. It was remove that which is blocking it and you will see that the neshama will fly. It's a beautiful mashal. Uh, but people unfortunately are, are caged in. 
not realizing that they have the ability to free themselves by opening the door. And the opening the door is, of course, equivalent to basically releasing one's uh, physical uh, limitations, those physical limitations that are standing in the way. Releasing them, in other words, getting them out, getting them out of the way. They are the ones that are blocking the door, blocking the entrance. The, f the physical meaning, the, the food, the pleasures, anything that's physical that the body craves stands in the way of the neshama. The greatest test for a Jew or for any human being actually, the greatest test of one's emunah, of one's faith, is actually tested in this area of where the Ratzon of Hashem is in conflict with the one's own personal Ratzon. This is really the area where one can see how strong his emunah is, how strong his relationship is with Hashem. And whose Ratzon comes first? It's a, therefore a very, very powerful Mishnah. I think it's a very powerful Mishnah. There's so much here that, uh, that, that can be very, very useful. Another reason why it's a good idea to be mevatel al ratzon for Hashem's ratzon is because the human mind cannot fully comprehend Hashem's mitzvot, right? He asks of us to do certain things and we say, well, why? Why? You know, a lot of people have a problem with that. They don't understand it. They don't want to do it. <laughs> yeah, I asked them, do, have you ever flown on an airplane? Sure, I always go. I travel overseas. He says, did you ever insist on, on asking the pilot how the plane works before you board the plane? He says, no, I trust him. He says, oh, the pilot you trust, but him you don't, right? You, you're willing to go on the plane even though it's very dangerous. You know, you're flying in the air. You trust the doctor when he gives you a prescription, swallow this twice a day for the next 10 days, you don't know what you're taking in your mouth, only because he knows how to scribble on a piece of paper and he wears a white gown and he has a certificate on the wall that he passed. Maybe he had a D, a D minus. You can still pass with a D minus, right? <laughs> he didn't fail, but maybe he was a D minus student and you're trusting that doctor because of his white gown. <laughs> Think about it. So, no, I don't understand why Hashem can't doesn't want us to wear a suit with wool and linen. You know, shot this. It is a hook, it's a decree. It's not a logical commandment like honor your parents. Huh? Yeah. So, but tell Ratzon Ha, just get rid of your Ratzon. Don't try to figure everything out because you won't be able to. Our Sechel, the human Sechel, the human mind is not capable of figuring everything out. That is why the rabbis tell us when it comes to eating pork, to the command the prohibition of eating pork, don't say Don't ever say, ah, pork is disgusting. I can't have it. I wouldn't eat it. I wouldn't touch it. It's disgusting. Don't say that. Say it could be okay. It could even be tasty. It might be just fine. But I can't consume it because my, my God told me not to. Why not say that, you, that it's disgusting? Because that's minimizing the connection that we are supposed to have with Hashem by giving a logical explanation to you. That's a logical you know, Oh, I'm not going to have it. It's disgusting. No. Don't say that because you don't really know the reasons, number one. You don't know why Hashem gave us that. It has nothing to do with health. And by giving an explanation, no matter how logical it, it appears, oh, it has all these bacteria. When we, when we do that, we minimize the tzivuy of Hashem. The tzivuy Hashem is because Hashem said so. That's why I don't have it. And when one begins to give all kinds of rationales, even though there may be some truth to it, maybe not, but if he, if he does so, it takes away from, uh, from basically not doing something only because Hashem said so. You know how strong that is? I don't do so because He said so. That's good enough for me. It was good enough for my father and for my grandfather and for all the generations they were willing to give their life for this. It's good enough for me. I don't need to understand why. That's very powerful to say that. I, I trust Him just like you trust your doctor. <laughs> you trust your doctor. <laughs> and Hashem not, it's, it's incredible.
Here we were talking about Ritzonot. We were talking about wishes, personal wishes, other people's wishes, Hashem's wishes. What's funny is that not, not everyone, unfortunately, has a pure Ratzon. What I mean by a pure Ratzon is to really do the right thing. And to do the right thing, I mean in an objective way, where we are not biased and, of course, have a, a personal preference. Not everybody, therefore, I, I call it, a, or I'd like to describe it as, as not everyone has a Ratzon Tahor, a pure Ratzon. And that is why we're being advised. Do whatever Hashem wants, because unfortunately, our Ratzon is not always pure. There's a cute story, <laughs> true story, yeah, that happened in South Africa. I have two stories to tell you about South, South Africa today. This one story happened in South Africa years ago where somebody was about to die. And he had a lot of money. This is the days before telephones, before telegrams, before faxes, before anything. He's all by himself, his family is in London. What does he do? How does he let them know that he has all this money to give them over? Well, cash. How does he get it to them? So he asks an individual that he was acquainted with, can you do me a favor? He says, I don't have that much time left. Here's all this money that I own. And uh, when you come there to London, take what you want for yourself from this money, and the rest give to my daughter. I think it was a daughter. There's another similar story with his son. I says, that's great. Imagine he's leaving behind $100,000. So he's going to take a certain amount for him. And what do you think? He's going to take most of it for him, right? <laughs> <laughs> so that's what happened. He, he arrived there. He said, thank you, you know. And of course, he said, I'll do it for you. Uh, so and the man passed away. When he arrived in London, he told that relative of the man that this man left $100,000. He told me I can take what I want for myself and give the rest to you. So I take 90000 for myself and give you 10000 So you can imagine the relative. They were in complete shock. First of all, they found out that the man passed away, and now they have to deal with this this guy who's, who <laughs> is basically stealing all the money for himself, they both agreed to go to a Din Torah. The man says, listen, he told me that. Take whatever you want for yourself and give the rest, you know, and give uh, what you want, whatever you want, uh, to, the, to the relative. So, I took what I want for myself, and I gave what I want to the relative. So the rabbi says, put the money down on the table. He put down the money on the table. He says, 90,000 will belong to the relative and 10,000 to you. He says, why? He says, that's exactly what you said. No, I didn't. He says, no, listen carefully to what you said, what he told you. Take for yourself what you want and give what you want for yourself to that individual. <laughs> In other words, take for yourself what you want and that which you want <laughs> give to the individual. So the man was very smart in phrasing it that way. <laughs> In order to secure the money that it should be transferred over properly, he said it in those words. But look at this example of person thinking of himself. But the, the nice thing about this story is that we, we see that if a person does do Hashem's wishes, Hashem will make it that his wishes will also be his wishes. Obviously this man was only interested in himself. But in the end, that man that passed away outsmarted him. Before we go on to the next point, this Mishnah is, contains with it, or these words, the first part of it, contain with it what the rabbis tell us, When a righteous man decrees, Hashem fulfills it. A righteous man makes a blessing, Hashem carries it out, makes it happen. In other words, that's the koch of when a person makes Hashem's retzon, his retzon.
So, to summarize this one Mishnah, this is a, a secret. This is a, a powerful tool to get people to do what we want. You know, obviously it's not everything we want. We, we started off saying it all depends on what Hashem wants. That's, that's what really matters. But this is, in a way, a very powerful way to get our way in life. In other words, as long as that way is in accordance with the Torah. But there are all kinds of hurdles. And there are other people who have their own interests. And there's politics. Yeah. No. I will do always what Hashem wants, first and foremost. No. In the end, your wishes will be His wishes too. Very powerful. I think this is a very powerful tool. As, as the, there's a pasuk actually that says, "Birzot Hashem darchei ish gam oivav yeshlim ito." When Hashem approves of man's way, of a man's ways, even his enemies will make peace with him. They don't realize this in Israel. Do you know that if the Jewish people in Israel would do what Hashem wishes, all the enemies they have would would, would go along with them, would say, "Okay." It's a, when Hashem approves of our ways, Gam Oivav, even his enemies, make peace with him. They have no trouble with him. So what does that tell us that when the enemies are, are trying to attack, it's because something is wrong with what we're doing, with our ways. Well, how about that they don't know this? It's so clear. It's always been, it's always been this way. The Torah hasn't changed. All right, the next, the next point in the Mishnah. Hillel Omer, Al Tifrosh Minat Sibur. Don't set yourself apart from the Tzibur. The Tzibur means the community, from the shul, from the, from, the, from the group, depending on the circumstances that we're talking about. Don't be apart. Don't stand out in being very, very different than the rest. And this, of course, is, is especially true at times of happiness and or at times of sadness. When the community is happy, one needs to be happy for them. Even though that happiness, that source of happiness, may not affect you directly, it's not your simcha, be happy for them. Try to rejoice with them if possible. Don't be poresh. I don't want to have anything to do with them. And same thing with, with sadness, with tragedy. Tisha B'Av, we all sit on the floor. We all mourn for the same temple. One cannot be poresh and say, no, it doesn't apply to me. We're all one family. That's what he is saying. If we're all one family, then you have to feel in the pain of your brethren. If there's a tragedy in New York that affected a Jewish family, it should pain us. If a Jew is not pained by something that happens in another country to another Jew, there's something wrong with him. You can't set yourself apart. You're part of the same tzibur. This is, of course, also talking about the importance of a minyan. One can claim, well, I prefer to pray at home. It's so quiet, nobody disturbs me. That, you have a point, but you don't realize how much you're losing out because the tzibur, the, the, the congregation, the minyan, has much more power than individuals. When an individual prays on his own, the rabbis tell us, you cannot have the full kavanah the full concentration and understand every word he's saying. And his praise, therefore, is not as effective. Whereas in a minyan, there's several people praying, and each one fills in what the other one is lacking. They complement each other. They complete each other. It has much more koach. Hashem listens to the prayer of, of the many. And therefore, even if one did not have any kavanah, but he prayed in a minyan in a shul, together with a minyan, the chances are that his prayer will, will be received or will, will be heard much more so than if he prayed by himself. Tzibur has tremendous koach, whether it's tefillah or tehillim, tzibur. Yeah. And therefore, even if in that tzibur, some people are not so religious. Yeah. Nevertheless, it's a tzibur. It's a congregation. Hashem listens to the prayer of the tzibur more readily than he would to the prayer of individuals. So, alti frosh mina tzibur. You don't want to be apart from the tzibur. 
And of course, Al Tifrosh Min Atzibur also has to do with what Moshe tells us. Torah Tzibaram Lo Moshe Morasha Kilat Yaakov. The Torah is the heritage or the inheritance of the entire Jewish nation. It is, it is not only something that it belongs to the rabbis. Community affairs, therefore, should be something that is shared by every member of the community. Everybody should pay their dues. Everybody should carry the burden. Everybody should be involved in some way, at some capacity. That's what Altif Rosh Menatzibu means. In other words, don't say, oh, I don't want to get involved. This does not apply to me. No, everybody gets involved. In every organized Jewish community, if it's really well organized, they would have a fund to take care of the poor. They would have people taking care of the sick. They would have people taking care of the widows. That's the way it should be. People of Hebra Kadisha taking care of burials, right? Sofer, Mohel, that are necessary, right? All kinds of community needs. So a Jew cannot just live anywhere he wants in a cabin, in the forests, or in the mountains, all by himself. That's not the kind of life a Jew lives. He needs to live in a community. He needs the community. Community needs him. That's what Jewish life is all about. It's a communal life. And it's a life where, where we all depend on each other. And we all need each other. Next, next point. Al ta'min be'atzmecha ad yom motcha. Don't trust yourself until the day you die. Wow, this is also very powerful. Don't trust yourself. Why would somebody trust himself? Well, trusting oneself means to be overconfident. People say, "Oh, this won't happen to me." Right? What does he mean? You know. Some people, because of their evil inclination, they made a mistake. They made a mistake, and they uh, succumbed to the yetzer. A person should not say, well, this never happened to me, and it will never happen either, because I, I've taken care of myself. I, I don't play around. I don't do silly things. I don't mess around. I don't, you know, I don't get involved in those risky enterprises that I should be concerned that this may happen to me. Don't ever say that. If the right challenges occur, a person may fall. I'll give you a quick example. Let me ask you a question. Let's say somebody is stopped by a traffic officer in Mexico and in the United States for something that he committed. Okay, a, a, a crime, a misdemeanor, whatever it is. And it, it may cost him a big fine, it may cost him some jail time, they may impound his car, whatever, for whatever he did. In Mexico, you take out your driver's license and you put 100 pesos, you know, with it. You know, and you tell the policeman, I know, you know, basically, you know, I'll be more careful next time. And he says, yeah, okay. Have a nice day. And that's the way you finished within about uh, 60 seconds. Of, you're done with it. Of course, depending on what was done. Now, there's a good and bad part about this. The bad part about this is that bribery is wrong. Bribery means that there's a lack of justice. The good part of that is that when you really didn't do anything wrong, you sometimes need a quick fix, you know, to get around. The, the bureaucracy. And sometimes it's good, as we say in Yiddish, to schmear. That's the way it works, you know, in certain places. And schmearing is sometimes very, very helpful. What can we do? That's part of life. Okay, now let's turn to the United States of America. Could you put a $100 bill on your driver's license and the policeman will say, okay, let's forget about it? Probably no. You may get even into more trouble, right? Okay, what if you put a thousand dollars on your driver's license? Ten bills of a hundred dollars. Well, what would happen then? Hmm? There's a chance. There's a chance? Texas. In Texas? Yeah. <laughs> what about in Oklahoma? 
Yeah. Also, for yeah. sure. Yeah. <laughs> okay, we're in doubt. Let's say not a thousand dollars. What about five thousand dollars? It's a bundle, freshly printed from the bank. You know. Will he then hesitate to take it? Oh no. The the more you raise the bribe, the larger the amount of money, the more tempting it is. Even if somebody usually does not make the mistake of falling for it, he may fall for it. Isn't that true? Huh? You, you, this can happen with any avera. Right? I'm not going to give other examples. I think money is good enough. There are other examples, other averot, but uh, let's not get into details of what can tempt someone. People can be tempted, all kinds of situations. Somebody's, I told you, I've given you examples of somebody's about to make a million dollars. Really? All he has to do is sign on Shabbat. Remember that example? Mm -hmm. He starts thinking, wow, a million dollars, I can do a lot of tzedakah with that. So maybe that's okay if I sign. I mean, signing after all, I could also sign with my left hand. I learned once upon a time. All of a sudden, his attorney, the Yetzara, begins to work. A million dollars. Even they, oh, forget a million, three hundred and fifty thousand dollars, not a million. Still, it's a lot of money. Chaval, he will say. You know, there's a lot of people in Israel that can use this money. I can give them maaser. <laughs> Hashem says, I don't need your maaser. <laughs> I don't need your tzedakah. I want you to do the right thing. This is a test. Don't you realize this is a test? <laughs> people don't realize they're being tested, and there's a big. Satellite, Bashamayim, <laughs> that is basically looking down, recording everything. He doesn't realize this. It's a test. And that's what it's all about. It's about temptation. So, Al Tamen Batsmecha, Don't trust yourself until the last day, because even if you succeeded once upon a time, who says you will succeed tomorrow? Tomorrow's test and tomorrow's challenge may be different may be harder. You may not have the same strength, right, or conviction or whatever it is to be able to deal with that challenge the way you did years ago when you were young. So don't trust yourself. And therefore, don't take off your guard. Don't take any chances. That's what he's basically saying. The answer is around till the last day of one's life. The last day. also has another interpretation that can be applicable to, and that is, don't believe in yourself. Don't be content with what you have achieved so far. Don't think of it as being so much. Aspire to grow even more. That's it. I've done, Baruch Hashem, I've accomplished. No, I'll tell me that's that you've accomplished anything. You've accomplished just so little compared to what you can really accomplish. So don't give up. Don't let go. Continue to aspire, continue to achieve as much as possible because life is short and you can still accomplish a lot. I'll tell me that's that you're such a girl, you're such an accomplisher. You know, what you did is nothing compared to what you still, you can still accomplish. Al-Tamin is also an overconfident attitude of an individual who doesn't understand that things can go wrong so easily. After all, we're only human, and we all make mistakes, blunders. So be careful. Be careful not to trust yourself so much, because anything can go wrong so easily. And, and one of my favorite stories is a story that my grandfather Allah Shalom, told my father when he was in South Africa. This is the second story about South Africa. <laughs> when my grandfather was in South Africa for a visit, he met with the Ponovish Rav, the rabbi of Ponovish, the one who established the yeshiva of Ponovish. And the rabbi tells my grandfather, I have an incredible story to tell you. I met with this wealthy man, obviously he was going after a donation for the yeshiva, and this wealthy man approached me, he says, Rabbi, I have a question that's been bothering me for a long time. Every day before we pray Amidah, Shmon Esrei, you know, we say the words, 
משפיל גאים עדי ארץ ומגביע שפלים עד מרום. That Hashem has the ability to bring down the arrogant in one moment. To the ground. Completely to the ground. Millionaires, arrogant, bring them down to the ground where they become penniless. And he can also elevate the poor in one second, you know, they win the lottery. Boom! Millionaires. He says, Rabbi, I don't understand the first part of this. God can bring somebody down all the way, penniless. Rabbi, come on. Let me tell you. Besides the factories that I have in South Africa, I have real estate in Manhattan. And besides that, I have bank accounts in Switzerland. So, Rabbi, what could happen? What can go wrong? If the government in South Africa takes away the factories, they burn down or something happens, I still have the real estate in Manhattan. Real estate in Manhattan, something happens and they devalue it, I still have bank accounts in Switzerland. Rabbi, do you mean to say that God can take all of it away just like that in one second? He says, no, you got it all wrong, Rabbi says. You don't understand. God does not have to take away those things from you. He can take you away from your property. <laughs> That's all. This man died two days later. That's what the rabbi was telling my grandfather. And you know what happened two days later? This man died. <laughs> he said, I couldn't believe it. So my grandfather says, you must be a great rabbi. I mean, <laughs> he says, no, but it's crazy for somebody to think like that. How could, he, how could he make such a comment? How could he think like that? What's the question? God can take you away from the possessions. He doesn't need to take away anything from you. And the guy passed away. So one has to be careful. Be careful. Don't be over-trusting and over-confident in yourself until the very last day. Anything can happen. Anything can go wrong. We have very little control. And we depend only on Hashem, of course. All right, the last, the last few items in the Mishnah are also very important. Don't judge your friend until you're in his shoes, as they say in English, until you reach his place. These are the simple words. You cannot judge somebody until you are in his place. What does that mean? Basically, until you're in his shoes, until you are going through what he is going, don't judge him. How he's been behaving, how he's been acting, how he's been reacting. Every circumstance, every situation is different. People are different. People act differently. Not, not everybody acts the same or reacts the same to a given situation. People are different. So don't judge him until you are in his shoes. Who knows what you would do had you been in his case. You know, sometimes people go through tremendous hardships in life and they act in a very unusual way, let's just say, unusual. You know, and, and we're upset at them, we criticize them, you know, how and this and why. Don't judge. Don't judge. You don't know what you would do if you were in the same situation as he was. So be careful on how you judge people. The Kabbalah, however, or Hasidus, says, has a novel approach to this interpretation. If you are an observant, in other words, an observer, if you are an observer of this situation, if they brought you to observe this incident where you are being a judge, do you know why you are the observer? Because Bashamayim, they want to see how you will judge because they want to judge you about something similar. So if you judge negatively, oh, he should not have done that. They will say, hey, you just sealed your fate. We were waiting to see how you judge now to de decide your judgment for you. Since you said about him, he should not have done that, then we will also write on your book, you should not have done that, whatever it is. Mm -hmm. So the person has to be very careful on how he judges others. They may, at that moment, judge him for something similar that he did. And therefore, they brought him to this situation so he can observe that, see how he judges it, and depending on how he judges it, that's all they would judge. If he says, well, poor fellow, he didn't know any better. It's not his fault. He was going through tremendous pressures. You know, it was giving him the benefit of the doubt. But Shemayim, they will do it too. Oh, look, he's being easy on him. We're going to be easy on him too. See what I mean? So it's very, this is an important point too. It may happen. I'm not saying all the time, but it may happen that based on how a person 
gives judgment on someone else, that is how they will give judgment on him. Another very important idea, perhaps, about Achetagiel and Como is that there are people who you see in Shul, and you see he prays like a big tzaddik of a hundred years ago. He shakes and he prays for a half an hour, and he so appears to be a very big tzaddik, a righteous man. The way he talks, he's so humble, doesn't raise his voice. He's nice to everyone. Wow. You're impressed this guy must be a tzaddik nistar, perhaps, you know, one of those hidden tzaddikim. Who knows? This guy, you know, he could be a hypocrite. You don't know. Maybe he's rotten. He's just putting up a facade. You know, there are people like that. So how do you find out what the person is all about? Alta dinet chabercha, don't evaluate him or judge him by what you see next to you. Achtagilim, go to his house. <laughs> In other words, go and find out how he is at home. Go and find out what kind of a person he is at home. You know, in his own surroundings, not in shul in front of people. He could be very nice. There are people like that. They're so nice and friendly when they're in public, but at home, they're abusive. They're aggressive. They're monsters. Yeah, there are people like that. So a very interesting <laughs> interpretation of Achetagiel in Como. Be careful how you judge him. Don't just go by what the eye sees. You, you may not see. You may not be seeing everything. This is this is there's there's a story with Rav Ashi and Menashe. You heard of Menashe the king? He worshipped idols. And Rav Ashi, who's at the time of the of the Gemara, the Moraim, was having a discussion. And he basically said something that was disrespectful, that appeared to be disrespectful of Menashe. You know, Menashe, you know, we're going to talk about tomorrow about Menashe, our colleague, our friend, uh, about this, uh, this, this whole Yetzer of Avodazara. In other words, this Avodazara, the idol worshiping that took place during his time. So that night he had a dream with Menashe. You call me your friend? I'm a colleague of yours. I'm on the same level as you. He asked him a question in halakha. And Rav Ashi didn't know the answer. He was amazed. This is a tamid chacham. Menashe is a tamid chacham. So why do you call me your colleague? He says, well, who do you think you are? I mean, you don't even know the answer to this question. He says, I'm sorry, but how come you worship? I know if you're such a big tamid chacham. He says, if you would be living in my time, you would pick your bag, you would pick your, your coat, and you'd come running with me to go worship idols, he says. You know, you have no idea of the yetzer, of the evil inclination that exists, of the, of the pressures of Abu Dazara back then. Today we don't know Abu Dazara, we think it's silly, it's foolish. Why would people worship a stone? You know, even though they knew it, they believed it represents some power. So how could you worship other things other than God? What's, what was so enticing, attractive about it? He says, you don't understand it because you don't have it now. Had you been living during our time, you would rush. <laughs> he said, you would rush with me to go do this. So the next day, he said, I made a mistake. He basically, you know, asked forgiveness and made a mistake. He didn't realize, you know, what these people really had to deal with during the time that there was a Yetzerara for Avodah Dazara, which we no longer have. So be careful not to criticize others. You don't know what you would have done in, that, in their situation. There's also, there's also a note of caution here, of not being mekatreg on someone. You see somebody going through a very, very hard time in his life, bankruptcy, lawsuits, prison perhaps. Don't say, oh, this man, he must have done all the Averot in the world to deserve that. After all, it's me Shamayim, what he's going through. We are not in any position to say that. We don't know the reasons for anything. And Chazu Shalom, when a person says that, he's, being, he's bringing Kitrugig accusations on him and on himself for saying that. So don't volunteer or don't suggest why people are suffering. We don't know the Cheshbonot of Hashem. It could be previous reincarnations, it could be Kaparat, something, of course. We don't know. Pain is, of course, has to do with something we may have done wrong, but we are not, no one else should be in the, no one else should volunteer and try to say 
that he thinks he knows why this person is going through. That's, that's, that's very dangerous. Next point. Don't ever say something that should not be heard in public. Don't reveal it, because if you do reveal it, eventually it will get out. As the rabbis tell us, Osnaim Lakota, the walls have ears. Even though there's another interpretation that says, don't say anything that is not clear, that needs further clarification. In other words, don't assume people understand it now, uh, or that they eventually will understand it. In other words, if you're going to explain something, make sure that you explain it well the first time and don't rely on people figuring it out later on. But that's not, I don't think that's the basic in, uh, interpretation of these words. It fits more like the, uh, the interpretation of being able to keep a secret. Secrets are meant to be, to be secrets. And if something should not be disclosed, then don't disclose it even to one individual, depending on what it is, of course, because words get out. Once something is disclosed even to one individual, it runs the chance of it being made public. So if it's something you don't want anybody, anybody, anybody to find out, for, don't, even talk, don't even reveal it to one person. So he's telling us basically be very, very careful with what information you disclose. There's a story in the Gemara of Hordus. As you know, Hordus was a slave, became the emperor in Israel. Unfortunately, I mean, the Jews suffered during his reign. He killed out many, many Tamidei Chachamim. And uh, he approached Baba Ben Buta, who was a big Tamid Chacham. He was the only one, one of the only ones that he saved. He spared his life. And he was blind. Baba Ben Buta was blind. And he wanted to see you know, how Baba Ben Buta relates to him. So he didn't tell him who he was. He comes to him. Look what this Hordos is doing to the Jewish people. He says, yeah, what, what should I do? Curse him! So basically, Baba Ben Buta says, Chaz Shalom, you can't curse anyone. And says, yeah, but he's a no one. No, but maybe still a, he's a ruler nevertheless. No, but he's not behaving himself. Look how he treats his brothers. Says, I'm afraid. I don't want to, to, to do anything where that eventually it will be heard, perhaps. There's nobody here besides me and you. Go ahead and say whatever you want about him. He says, no. He says, I'm still concerned. You know, the walls have ears. You know, it's not right. No matter what Hordas did to try to tempt him, he couldn't get him uh, to, to say something negative about him. And he didn't know who he was talking to. At the end, Hordas said, it's me. <laughs> mm -hmm. You know, I'm Hordas, in other words. He was amazed how the Talmud Echachim was so careful. He says, had I known that all the rabbis are like that, they're so careful, I would not have killed them. So he regretted, after that incident with Baba Ben Buta, he regretted what he did. That's when he started, I believe, his, his remodeling of the Bet HaMikdash as a way to atone for his sins. He remodeled, major remodeling of the Bet HaMikdash was done through Hurdus. A lot of the stones you see today, the Kotel Maravi, and a lot of uh, other things are uh, projects that he, he undertook. Anyways, be careful <laughs> in, in saying anything that should not be overheard. All right, the last point in the Mishnah. Also, very, very valuable information. Don't ever put off for tomorrow what you can do today, right? That's what they say in English and in various other languages. Don't ever say, when I have time, I will, I will, do, I will learn. When I have time. When, I, when, when, it, when, when it's possible for me, when I have the leisure, I will do it. I will learn. No, Shema Loti Pane, you may never have that time, that free time. This is so true because life is short and the ideal, the ideal moment that we're waiting for doing something may never come. If something is truly important, then do it now. Because let's assume that you do have the time to do it two years from now. Chaval on those two years that went by that you didn't do it, that you could have. Imagine somebody finally does get married at the age of 43 because they didn't want to or they pushed it off. Baruch Hashem! They found the moment, they, they found the right time, they finished their college, they got three PhDs, you know. They wanted three for some reason. So it took them many years to finish. So whatever, they had to make money. 
you know. And finally, they're ready. You could have been making bar mitzvah, you could have been to your children by now, or perhaps even marrying one off by that time. So even if you succeed to get what you want at that point in life, what about all that time that was wasted of no learning Torah, of no mitzvot? Balet Shuvah, they become Balet Shuvah at the age of 60. Kol they're very welcome. Hashem says, I love you. But you lost your children because those children that you had, they're in their 30s or 40s, they may not do Teshuvah. You have no influence over them as much as you have when they were long, young little kids. So what, even though you got yourself to return to me, the kids, the three, four, five, six kids that you've had, they're all on their own. It's up to them if they want to do Teshuvah. So had you done Teshuvah in your younger years, you would have gained so much more. Don't push it off. I've had Israelis come and tell me, we just arrived in America, first thing you want to do is make money. I'm told there's gold in the streets of America. I'm going to find all that gold. He said, I'm going to make some money, right? Then I'm going to buy a house. Then I'm going to get married. <laughs> and then I will become religious. <laughs> By the time they made the money, right? By the time they bought their home, maybe, right? They have a big stomach. They're bald. Who's going to want to marry them? Right? <laughs> so they're, not, they're never going to get to that point. Right? And then they're going to keep Shabbat after that. It's never going to happen. Right? You know, they push off things, they've got to make money, they've got to buy this, they got to buy this. Yeah. In the meantime, so much precious time is lost. A, a valuable moment that comes in our life should be therefore used to its fullest. Because there are times, as the Kabbalah explains, that the soul, the nefesh of the neshama of the individual is full of excitement and cheshek to do a mitzvah. It's lavut, it's emotional, it's crying, tears are flowing down the cheeks. There are times when the neshama is awakened. And all of a sudden there is, as we say in Yiddish, he has a bren. A bren means something is burning in him, a desire, fervent desire to do something. I'm going to do it. That bren doesn't last more than a few seconds. It, 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 it dissipates. It loses the heat. So therefore, whenever that comes, that the neshama is awakened for, for a moment, it's rachamim bin hashamayim, by the way. It's rachamim bin hashamayim. They have pity on him, and they're waking him up. And all of a sudden, he feels something, some sort of excitement. Go ahead, and don't push it off. Take advantage of that moment. Because of another reason you don't want to push it off is because the more time goes by, those same things that we wanted to do a long time ago become more difficult to do. And it's not only age, and it's not only excitement. It's just as time progresses, we may lose the interest. We may not have the same tools. We may not have the same friends to help us. Things just change. And as life goes by, it, many, many things just become more difficult to do than, what they, we, they, than the ease which we, we could have done them in the earlier years. So we don't, we, don't want, we don't want to push off anything. Anything that is really valuable, that we know for sure, we're convinced that it's valuable and important to us, don't push it off. Do as much as you can even now. That's why I tell people, even if they have a shiur, where they, an hour of the time is spent in the class, but that day they had a good excuse, they had to go to a wedding. When you come home, spend five minutes learning something. Don't, don't do away with your custom, your daily custom, your daily routine, if it's, if it's a mitzvah, because even if you had a, just, a justifiable excuse, if you let go of it one day, you be, we become weaker. Our resolve becomes weakened. The Yetzirah defeated us, Chaz Shalom, that day. So we don't want him to, do, to win, we want to win. So we spend five minutes, five, not the whole hour, somehow. We pull out a tehillim, we pull out a book, we learn Mishnah, we go over the parasha, we do something to make up for that hour. Something is better than nothing. In this way, we won again. We retained our strength, we retained our interest, we retained our devotion, we retained hopefully our excitement. And Bezat Hashem, we will retain the continuity in the performance of all the mitzvot. Amen.